Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It always has been and always will be. The Torah proper instructed the people of Israel to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. This is where Shomer Mitzvot begins, by loving Hashem and accepting Him on His terms. By this, I mean accepting His means of covenant obedience. For today, this means acceptance of Yeshua, His only Son, for Jew and non-Jew alike. Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. My name is Ariel Ben-Lyman Hanavi. This is episode number 149. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together, allowing us to share our thoughts and our hearts together and with you via this vehicle of the Internet and, of course, and most importantly, through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the um, the resurrected Messiah within us. We know, Lord, that um, this is um, an opportunity for us not just to bless you and to study your words, but it's an opportunity for us to, um, to connect to one another. Um, we need the fellowship. We need to strengthen one another. We need to bless one another. Indeed, we're commanded to do the very thing. And so we pray that we will take this opportunity to um, to welcome one another and to just uh, uh, befriend one another and to strengthen one another with the, with our words, uh, with our well wishes, and with our prayers and our thoughts, which are focused on our Lord Messiah and the and the um, the work that He's done for us, the fellowship that we enjoy as believers, even though there's, we're separated from from around the world, from different parts of different countries, um, different places. Uh, near and far, uh, nevertheless, we know that um, um, it's by your spirit that we can uh, join together and um, we can praise our Lord Messiah Yeshua and give him the praise and glory that's due his name. Be with us for tonight's study. I pray that you will be uh, the preeminent one, that your words would ring true, that they would sink deep down into our soul, into our hearts, causing us to uh, walk differently, to live differently, to be a light for those around us. Help us to be a witness. Help us to be able to share our testimony boldly. Um, help us to be able to weather the storm of all of the nonsense around us, the fear, the confusion, the um, the, the, the racial tension that's, that's prevalent in uh, so many parts of America and things like that. Um, we'll be careful, Lord, to continue to, to look to you and to trust in you. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, Bishim Yeshua. Amen. Thanks again for joining me week after week. This is the Live Internet Studies. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm a Torah teacher at Congregation Kehilat Tunava in Thornton, Colorado, which is the Harvest. As you can see on my screen right now, I've got the Harvest website pulled up. Graftedin.com is where you'll find us online. We'd love you to have to join us in uh, in person, or if you can't, at least catch our YouTube videos where we live stream them to YouTube. And as you can see on my screen right now, um, there's a link to Yeshua the Living. Torah, or the Torah in living color. In case you haven't guessed it, Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Torah. That is, from our perspective, and I think you would agree, um, he is the word personified, not just in that spiritual sense, where we know that Jesus was you know, the word that which became flesh, like we read about in John 1, 1, but as we study the Torah week after week, like we do in our Messianic um, settings, our Bible studies and things like that, we should never lose sight of the fact that we are to be led and drawn to the Master himself. Our study of the written word is for the purpose of drawing us closer to the living word. 
which is Yeshua himself. It's a relationship with him that we seek, and it's a relationship with him that is vital if we're going to survive these um, uh, last and e- confusing days, these, e- these last and evil days, as we lead up to the, his second arrival. I've also got my own uh, website at TetzeTorah.com. You can find me online at www.tetzetorah.com. TetzeTorah.com. From the homepage, there's the cluster of links that you can see on my screen there. And I pray that the studies will be a blessing to you as you click around through the resources. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd like to let you know about. You can find me on youtube.com forward slash C for the word channel forward slash Tetze Torah Ministries. All one word there, Tetze Torah Ministries. And um, I'm quite the busy person. If you click on the little videos section um, for my YouTube channel, you'll see that I upload things every single day. It's uploaded updated daily and so um, uh, if you do visit my YouTube channel make sure you subscribe so that you can be a member of the family so you can join in and in, in all the fun that we like to share together make sure you hit the little bell for notifications so you're notified whenever I do upload new content hit the little thumbs up that indicates that you like the content that you're watching that also helps my YouTube algorithm there um, and then um, hit the um, What's the fourth thing? Oh, leave uh, leave comments. Leave comments. Let me know what you like or what you don't like or how I've been a blessing to you, um, and what content you'd like to see. If you've got questions or topics that you'd like me to, to cover, well, then leave them in the comments and let me know. I try to go through the comments as often as I can. I can't get through all of them right away, but uh, I do my best, being a, kind of a one-man show here. And then lastly, hit the little, there's a little arrow as you're watching videos down there that lets you share the content with other people, make sure you hit that little arrow so you can share the content with your other people in your social media networks, okay? That would be great. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week. Um, Let's give you some logistics real quick um, for these studies. For those of you with me in the live class right now, you can see on my screen, this is episode number 149. The meeting date is July 31st. That's the USA date 2021 for those of you who are meeting with me on that side of the world. The meeting date for all of our meetings is Saturday afternoon from 4 p.m. to approximately 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And in that hour-long study, we broke it, I break it down into 30-minute sections. The first 30-minute segment is um, on Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food. Oh my, we're in part 65 tonight. We're plugging along through a section where we're talking about dietary issues, um, cash root, uh, clean and unclean as it relates to food, um, and what this would have meant to the first century uh, people and how it can impact us today. What are the kind of the, some of the practical applications if Paul says, uh, indeed all is clean, does that mean that we can just eat whatever we want? What? How would we have interacted with, uh, how would how would the first century recipients have understood his words and how do we understand his words today? The second, uh, sorry about that. The uh, second segment of our third hour-long study is given over to apologetic, uh, exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. We're in paper two, Yahweh and Yeshua, part eighty-two. We're still working our way through the review of part two because we're about ready to turn into part three. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and how He fits into the personhood or the Godhead of one God, three persons, that type of uh, idea. And so we're, we're going to be looking at, is Yeshua God an appeal to history by way of review? And we're going to talk about how that historically the church fathers had already begun to ponder this idea of how can one God be three persons? And we're going to just review again um, the notes from a doctor by the name of Dr. Bo Branson. And he's got a very uh, nice proposal that helps us make sense of Trinity. We'll watch a featured YouTube video tonight from my um, short question, short answer live series. What does it mean that Jesus fulfilled the law, but he did not abolish it? Of course, taking our um, wording from Matthew 5, uh, uh, what is it, like uh, 17 through 20 or so, uh, Jesus himself said, I've, come, I've not come to a, uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, what exactly does that mean? We'll look at that in the video tonight. These are the live studies brought to you by Skype week after week. If you'd like to join us, uh, the studies are free. Um, you just need to get access to Skype somehow. You can see the little blue banner on my screen right now on my website at tatesatora.com. If you go to that 
place, go to that link on my site and click on it. It'll just take you straight into the study. Like right now, if you were in the live study, <laughs> of course, this is like kind of redundant because you wouldn't be able to, uh, if you're in the study, then you're already with us. But um, for those of you who aren't Skype um, members or aren't joining us by way of uh, Skype week after week, well, then you can bookmark this page on my web, on my website, tetetor.com forward slash live internet studies. And uh, next time we have our study between 4 and 5 p.m. Central Standard Time on Saturday, then you can join us. So that's the way you can jump in, join us via Skype. And then one last thing real quick, if you do go to my website, take a moment to scroll to the very bottom and look at that black footer section where you can see some Hebrew writing and prayerfully consider supporting my ministry, this is a way that you can do it. You can help me out and uh, help me keep these teachings going out week after week. And uh, uh, I would be blessed if you would um, uh, consider con helping me out in this way. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Okay, without further ado, let's jump into the uh, Roman study. Let's blow that up nice and big. And let's see, how did I find that last time? Just like that. There we go. All right, kind of trying to figure out the best way to make this work. So we are um, we are in the study of Romans 14, and we're working our way through this set of passages. In Romans 14, starting in verse 14 through 18, we're looking at the question that I have posed for you on the screen. What exactly does, quote, nothing is unclean in itself imply? And the phrase nothing is unclean in itself, end quote, that's taken exactly from... Um, Paul's letter here. So let's read the verses real quick. I read these last week. I'll read them for you one more time. I've got English ESV over on the left side of the screen. I've got Greek SBLG and T over on the right side of the screen. Um, I'll read the English. I think I'll go, go English English, Greek, English, Greek, English, Greek. We'll go like that. So this will kind of substitute for some of the liturgy that we would normally read. I'm just pulling the liturgy into the study. All right. Uh, Romans uh, 14, starting in verse 14, Paul says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. And of course, that's where we're going to get a lot, most of the mileage out of tonight's study. If it's really unclean uh, to Paul, and it's unclean for anyone who thinks it un it's unclean, we're talking about food, well then, does that mean that we can eat anything we want? Is that really the interpretation that we should walk away from? The, the Greek of that same passage, verse 14, says, Oida kai pepesmai in kudio yesu hati uden koinon di kautu, e meto lagizamino ti koinon enai ekeno koinon. Looking at verse 15, Paul says, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And this is a challenge. Even if everything is clean, meaning let's suppose you can eat anything you want, even if, that's the interpretation of Paul's passage, where the dietary laws of Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 14, I'm sorry, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, let's say that kosher has been relaxed in Jesus, and Moses has already been overturned by the finished work of Messiah, and Paul's letting us know that don't worry about what you eat, you can eat anything you want. Even if that's the case, we still can't grieve each other by our choices. If one person chooses one diet, another chooses, person chooses another one, we have to consider the way our brother, uh, firstly Christian, by the way, would react to the food issues that, we're, um, that are being brought up by our table fellowship. Um, of course, I think in Paul's day that he, he had not done away with the dietary laws. And so when we talk about brotherhood, Primarily, we're talking about brother Jews and Gentiles in the Christian communities, but that's, there's a larger community that's still within Paul's perspective, and I think it's the larger Jewish community. And thus, brotherhood must include brother Israelites who were um, members of the same um, synagogues, the same church groups. Um, keep in mind that the early church was so closely connected to the Jewish synagogues that the religion that they practiced was viewed both inside and outside as essentially Judaism. Christianity had not yet been identified separate and distinct as, an, as a religion um, that we would know it today as separate and distinct from Judaism. Um, it, I think it would be a few more 
years along the road until, until we have that. So um, we have to be careful about not grieving one another. We have to walk in love no matter what you choose to eat or not choose, choose to eat. If you're going to keep kosher or not keep kosher, you still have the responsibility of walking in love. Um, look at verse 15 in the Greek. He says, Agar diabroma ha adelpha su lupetai ukati kata agapain parapates me to bromatisu ekenon apalue huper u Christos apethanin. Verse 16. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. I think he's a, primarily addressing the Gentile believers, the Gentile Christians, who feel that it's a good thing that we don't have to consider, uh, like the Jews of the day, that food sold in the marketplace, as long as it's on the kosher dietary list, we don't have to avoid it. As long as God said we could eat it, it doesn't matter if it's been used in an idolatrous worship. Consider um, what Paul wrote in the book of Corinthians, or um, and I think he wrote Corinthians and Romans around the same time when he was um, when he was in Corinth, I believe, uh, if, I got, if I can remember my history. So he's writing uh, to Corinthians about uh, food offered to idols, and then at the same time he pins the letter to Romans and sends that off to them, even though he's in Corinth. And he uses some similar um, topics about food offered to idols. On the one hand, Paul tells Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians to avoid idolatry. You don't want to participate in idol um, services, and if it if possible, you can avoid the idol the 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 the, the um, what he calls the cup of demons. You definitely don't want to participate in their um, what you would might call the idolatrous communion services. But if we're just talking about generically shopping for food in the common marketplace of that day, as a Gentile, you wouldn't have been. Ha- you wouldn't have been raised with the particular scruples of avoiding that type of food anyway. Of course, the Jews would have. But don't let your choice of shopping and eating um, be regarded of as evil to your brother. We're still connected to one another, Jews and Gentiles. This is a big table discussion that we're having between Jews and Gentiles. So in Paul's day, he's going to make sure that um, the thing that you think is good, meaning that you as a Gentile have been brought into proximity to the commonwealth of Israel. You've been grafted into the olive tree of Israel. You've been brought into the family of Abraham by faith in Messiah. And now you know that um, idols are nothing, and therefore it's okay that you can eat food that was once sacrificed to idols, but now it's just being sold in the marketplace. You don't have a problem with that. Jewish people might still have a little bit of pause and hesitation and reservation. Um, So don't let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. Uh, the Greek says, "Me blasphemesto un uh, humon to agathon. Verse 17 in this set that we're going to be looking at tonight. Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Again, the perspective is quite easy to understand. The context is doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that Food matters, or table fellowship is important, but it's not the most important thing. Uh, Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit trumps the table fellowship. It trumps food preferences. Meaning, in the end, if you can sacrifice your own personal freedom so that you can continue to build one another up in righteousness, in peace, and joy in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, fellowship with one another at that level where you're building each other up, where you're encouraging one another, where you're still staying connected rather than tearing each other apart over something as simple as food. This is the challenge that Paul is presenting us with, not just 2,000 years ago, but this carries over today. So we're going to have our differences in our denominations. Well, you guys keep kosher. Well, I don't think I need to keep kosher. Well, you guys think the dietary list has been uplifted and you no longer have to worry about that, but I think we should. So we got differences of opinion in today's messianic circles and today's Christian circles. However, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. So what does that mean? Does it mean we throw out all the rules and just get together? That's not actually what Paul's referring to when he says it's not a matter of eating and drinking. He's trying to let us know that, put into perspective, our food scruples and our food choices actually take a a back seat to the righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit that we should be striving towards uh, first and foremost. It means we need to practice deference. It means we need to yield to the other's opinions and the other person's um, 
reservations sometimes for the sake of fellowship. So it means um, uh, being willing to give up our own personal choices and yield to the choices of the other individual. The uh, Greek over on the right side of the page says, "U gar esten he baselea tu theu brosis kai posis ala de kai sune kai irening kai kara in pneumati hagio." And the final verse, verse 18, for this set of verses in this section, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Notice that Paul equates serving one another, like he talked about in the previous passage, right? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is uh, service to one another is actually deemed by God as a service to Messiah himself. And of course, that's nothing new. I'm not, you know, I'm not teaching anything deep and profound at the moment. Um, this is standard Christianity 101. As we serve one another, we're actually serving Messiah. And this is the biblical model that has been um, handed down to us. Thus, we need to understand that if we fight to have our own way, then the opposite is in effect. We're actually not serving Christ if we're pushing our own agendas. If we've got to have it our way when it comes to food, then we're not really serving Messiah. And um, God is not going to be most pleased with our service. And um, the approval from God and men is going to diminish. It's not that God's going to love us any less. Um, our love can't change. His love for us doesn't change. But keep in mind that this is about relationship, not just with each other, but with God. And so if we're going to fight with one another and, and quarrel and bicker over something as, as mundane as food, well then our relationship with God is going to suffer also. And um, our relationship with Christ himself is going to suffer. So uh, it's all interconnected. It's the two great commandments that you should talk about all over, all over again. Love God love your neighbor. That's how it's all connected together. Look at verse 18 in the Greek, over on the right side of the page. It says, Ha gar in tuto du luon to Christo eurestas to theokai dakimas tois anthropois. So now let's look at the notes. I apologize. Last week, I actually presented the... Um, wrong set of notes. I had a version of this commentary that I had uh, uploaded to my website and it was not the correct, it wasn't the most recent version. So um, I actually had two uh, paragraphs that were swapped around in the wrong spot. So last week I read the, par the paragraph that actually belongs to verse 20 down below instead of verse 14 through 18. So we kind of got a sneak peek. Instead, I swapped these around and what we're going to be looking at tonight is the accurate version. So I uh, put a little updated ver uh, date in case you did uh, ra uh, print off the PDF version. But nevertheless, those of you who weren't uh, listening to last week's study or weren't with us in the live study, well, then this is just uh, where you need to be anyway. So just follow along, and I'm going to walk you through some technical terms. And we're talking really about Paul's verse where he says, nothing is unclean in and of itself. And I know this because Yeshua revealed it to me. But if someone else thinks it's unclean, well, then it's unclean for him. So we're going to be asking the questions about this phrase, unclean. And let me kind of give you the short and skinny of it in case you get lost in the technicalities. Basically, there's terminology that made sense to Paul's readers, and this was because of their uh, familiarity with terms that would have already been used both in Jewish circles and would have been carried over into Gentile circles when it comes to um, animals that God says are clean and which animals are unclean, and how that God can designate an animal as permissible to eat by using a, a, an adjective, unclean or clean, and he can forbid you from eating a certain animal by using an adjective of clean or unclean. And within that context, we can then use food for sacrifice, use animals for sacrifice, and then that particular sacrificial food can be used in meals. And at that level, if that food uh, gets comes into contact with um, either unclean objects or unclean persons, or uh, perhaps it's a uh, food that's not connected to service to God, so like an idol idolatrous service, well then an additional adjective designation can be brought in. 
It's another term that we in English call unclean, or sometimes your Bible will render it common. So here's where the ambiguity comes up. Here's where the equivocation uh, arises. We've got terminology that from Paul's day would have been captured using specific Hebrew or Greek words, but by today's terms, some of those terms get overlapped. So in English, the term unclean can be represented by two different Greek words. But in Paul's day, if you were listening to the Greek or the Hebrew, you wouldn't have had a mis- you wouldn't have any had any misunderstanding because you were listening to the original Greek or Hebrew. But in today's settings, we don't have the original Hebrew or Greek that's always in front of us. We have, simply have our English translations, and unfortunately, the translators are not consistent. So that's why I need to get just a little bit technical. I hope that you don't get lost in the technicalities. I don't know if we'll get through all of this tonight. We'll just take a a, a, a chunk of it and study it. Um, we're primarily focusing on the concept of everything is unclean, or I'm sorry, um, nothing is unclean, but if it's unclean to you, well, then it's okay. So the first thing you probably want to do, uh, let's take a look. Let me see. I didn't bring this in earlier. Let me pull up Romans 14 and drop down to verse 14. And let's look at a moment here. I don't want to do that. I want to do that. Let's look at Romans 14, 14 in a few different versions, just real quick. The NIV uh, says, I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean. We're really just looking at this word unclean. That's all I really want you to just look at in this part of my uh, uh, section right here. Uh, the NIV has, I'm convinced that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. Even the, the NI, NLT just avoids the word clean or unclean. Uh, the ESV has the word unclean right there. Uh, the Berean Studded Bible has the word unclean. The Berean Literal Bible uh, uses the English word unclean. The KJV uses the word unclean. Uh, the New King James uses the word unclean. Uh, the NASB says unclean. NASB 1995 also unclean and 1977 also unclean. The Amplified Bible uses the word unclean but in brackets they put ritually defiled and unholy. The Christian Standard Bible says unclean. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says unclean. American Standard says unclean or Aramaic Bible says uh, nothing that is defiled. That's what they say. The contemporary English version says uh, foods uh, fit to eat or foods unfit to eat. That's a, the kind of a paraphrase. Uh, the Dewey Rames Bible uses the term unclean. The ERV says unclean. Good News Translation says unclean. We're almost done, guys. Uh, God's Word Translation says uh, food that is unacceptable. The International Standard Version says unclean. The Literal Standard Version says unclean. The Net Bible says unclean. The New Hard English Bible says unclean. The Weymouth New Testament says a few that is impure. Uh, the World English Bible says unclean. And then the last one on my list, Young's Little Translation, says unclean. All right, so why did I read all those versions? As you can tell, most of them say unclean. However, if we look at the original Greek for unclean, and we looked at it in the, in the um, when I read the Greek right here, the original Greek is actually right there. Let me highlight it for you. It's the word koinon, koinon, and this is rooted in the word koinos. Now, having said that, let's jump over to the study and read my commentary. You guys ready? Buckle in, because some of this is going to be technical. And then we'll read through some of this, and then uh, we'll try to do some um, practical application. Here's what I have to say. A knowledge of the social setting, as well as the original Greek words, will unlock the secrets to a proper understanding of this passage. Now, right away, I'm not trying to let you know that I've got this secret decoder ring that I have actually unlocked the secret that no one else knows about. It's this super special secret that no one else can understand unless you can read the Greek. No, that's not what I'm trying to imply. I'm simply trying to say that because we're 2,000 years removed from the original context and we don't speak in Koine Greek in today's social settings, well, then we lose the force of terminology that would have been 
quite easy for Paul's authorship to understand, but it's a little difficult for us because of our English translations that most of them just use the word unclean. So, follow along with me. I continue. In a commentary to Acts 10 and Peter's vision of the sheet with all manner of animals, I explained some of the Greek terms that are helpful in appreciating these sometimes confusing social situations where food and animals are involved. So that's the context of the terminology that we're going to be looking at is food. The words themselves can apply to a number of different contexts, but we're only concerned about animals and food at the moment. I go on to say, allow me to share an excerpt from that Acts 10 commentary in this Romans teaching. Okay, so this is from my Acts 10 commentary. Um, let's pick up the, uh, the, the quote here. Acts 10.14 in the KJV reads, quote, But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. End quote. So right away, what we see in the English is that Peter actually introduces two Greek words in reference to food when he's talking to God. He talks about anything that's common or unclean. We're interested in what those two words are. And of course, Peter is going to be received in Greek. What was he speaking? Was he speaking Hebrew? Was he speaking Aramaic? That's, in, that's not really the point at the moment. The point is that, that the writer Luke has preserved the book of Acts for us in Greek, so we're going to have to turn to the Greek to look at some of that. We will look at the Hebrew briefly, but we're not going to spend too much time on it. Um, the question I ask in this particular part of my commentary is, why does Kepha, that is Peter, make the dual distinction of common and or unclean foods in verse 14, which of course is rendered from the KJV? And you have to catch that or else you're going to lose the force of what would have been very easy for um, first century Jews and Greek speakers to follow along with. But by today's standards, we just kind of gloss over the two terms, common, unclean. We don't really even stop and consider uh, what they mean. I ask in my question, in my commentary, what do these words convey in their original languages? All right, so uh, stick with me. Let me just briefly jump through some resources to show you where we're going to go, and then I'll jump back to my commentary, and we'll pick up um, uh, right there. Let me see. Can I make that a little bigger? Do I want that to be 400? Give me a moment. I'm trying to. I'm, just pl I'm playing with the size of my uh, font here. See how big I want that. Yeah, I think I do want it. I, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna make it like that. Let's. I can get a little bigger. Makes it a little bit easier for me to see and a little easier for you guys to follow along with. All right. So uh, the first resource uh, that I just want to make you aware of is Acts 10.14 in the original Greek. Um, we can see here uh, that this is Peter's um, statement to God. Uh, and Peter said, In no way, Lord, for never have I eaten anything common or unclean. And the uh, the phrases in question, koinon, kai, Akatherton. Uh, uh, koinon is one term translated as common by the KJV, and akatherton is translated as um, unclean by the KJV, if I'm correct. Uh, was I right there? Let me jump back real quick and look. Um, common or unclean. Yeah, so common and unclean are the Greek terms in question. Uh, common is koinon, and unclean is akatherton. So, um, our first resource is actually tied to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 11, where you find most of the listings of animals that are clean and unclean. And when we drop down to verse 47, it says, and this is one of the one of the reasons, in fact, one of the primary reasons why God is giving the list of clean and unclean animals to Moses to give to Israel. And God says, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. And this is the reason why God's having Moses write this list down, is to make this particular difference. And just that first clause, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, in the English there. Uh, in the Hebrew, this would be right there. Lahavdil bain hatame uvein hatahor. So we've got these two words, unclean and clean in the English. In the Hebrew, unclean is tame and clean is tahor. 
We also have the Greek equivalents right here on the page as well. Um, let's see. It would be right there. Uh, the Greek says, Diastelai uh, ana meson ton akatharton kai ana meson ton katharon. And the, the two Greek terms that we're interested in, unclean is akatharton um, right there, and clean is katharon right there. And you can see this in the uh, English translation from the Septuagint Greek, unclean and clean. So that's one resource that we could look at. If we were to uh, focus just on the first one, um, akathartos, uh, the word uh, that's rendered for uh, unclean, we can see from this particular dictionary tool that I'm using that it's uh, the meaning is foul, unclean, impure, uncleansed. Um, you can see the various um, uh, technical terms, the technical um, renderings of this particular inflected uh, adjective in the Greek, which we're not going to really deal with. I just want to show you just this one tool, um, some of the ways that it's rendered. There's another tool that I'm fond of using from uh, uh, Bible Hub uh, that I do want you to just look at real quick. Uh, this particular Greek uh, term, um, akathartos, is an adjective, and it's can be rendered unclean or impure, and generally speaking, if I scroll down a bit into the uh, the Thayer's and uh, Greek lexicon, it talks about um, in a ceremonial sense that which must be abstained from according to the Levitical law, lest impurity be contracted. So the context, without getting too technical, is just it's a term that's attached to the um, temple and sacrificial system, and it's the common word that's used to refer to, say, unclean spirits in the New Testament, things like that. It's the it's the standard go-to word for unclean as um, viewed through the lens of God's perspective himself. Remember, God wrote the Torah, and God told Moses what to write, and so when Moses wrote akathartos, when, when referring to unclean animals, well then, that's the terminology that... Um, well, he, of course, he, he said uh, 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 Tame, but when we translate that over into Greek, it comes out as akathartos. All right. The other, oh, I'm sorry, uh, real quick, akathartos itself, if we use this one last tool, um, we can show how many times does this show up in the Greek New Testament, meaning the, um, the Bible that we use. We can scroll down, and in, in all of its inflections, it shows up. 33 particular times, but when we look at the LXX, that's the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, so the Old Testament, if we look how many times that it shows up, you can see right over on the uh, right side of the page that most of these references are in Leviticus, right? So, um, uh, it's easily understood that the context of this word is tied to the sacrificial system and animals and things like that. And so if we scroll back past all of those listings and see how many times it actually shows up in the um, uh, Septuagint, this term, akathartos, shows up 160 times. It's pretty popular uh, in the Old Testament. Now, having said all that, let's look at the other word that Paul, I'm sorry, that Peter and both Paul would have used. Going back to the, um, oops, going back to the Roman study, remember, uh, Peter says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. So we already looked at the word unclean, that which is, um, uh, uh, well, it, what is it? Is the word, we haven't, we haven't determined what it is, but he says common as well. Um, in the Greek, we already looked at the, it's koinos, and um, koinos and, oh, I'm forgetting. Let me just jump over here. Nope, we went there. Um, koinos and, oh, where do, I thought I had Acts 10 pulled. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I'm forgetting where my resources are. It is right there. Uh, koinon and akathartan, or koinos and akathartos. So common is koinos and akathartos is unclean. So let's look at, um, Coin on for a split second. Let's see what this has to do. This particular um, tool, there we go. This particular tool that I'm using in BibleHub.com, uh, Strong's number 2839, Coinos, it's translated as common, shared, uh, profane, dirty, unclean, unwashed. Um, 
primary uh, koinos is referring to what is defiled, stripped of specialness, because it's treated as ordinary or common. It describes the result of a person reducing what God calls special or holy to what is mundane, stripping it of its sacredness. All right, let me um, just accelerate this part because I, I feel I'm getting a little too technical for some of you and you might get lost. Looking at uh, Acts 10.15, God tells Peter, don't call common that which I've cleansed. And God uses the, the uh, of those two adjectives, koinos and akathertos, God only focuses on koinos. He says, uh, don't call koinos, don't call common what I have already cleansed. At the at the uh, akatharidsen, um, and so this term koinos, when we look at how many times it's used in the New Testament, right? That's the Bible that we're normally used to reading in the Greek. The Greek New Testament, uh, this word koinos shows up. Let me show you the number here: twenty-three times total occurrences. Twenty-three times. However, if we look at the LXX, the Septuagint, this word koinos. Let's see how many times it shows up. 25 times. Now, wait a minute. Just watch this for a moment. If you look at the verses over on the far right side of the screen, you'll see that the verses that this passage shows up in are not Leviticus. In fact, what are they? First, Maccabees, uh, Proverbs, Sirach, um, Fourth, Maccabees, um, Wisdom literature, Second Maccabees, Proverbs. So you notice that none of the references of the verses, none of them are in the Torah proper. In fact, most of them aren't even in the Old Testament that we carry around with our Bibles as Protestants. Most of these are in Deuterocanonical literature, the the the, uh, the extra biblical literature that shows up in a Catholic Bible, um, or you know, like the 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 Book of Jubilees and all those other extra bi uh, books that we don't consider as normal canon. The point I'm trying to make is that they don't show up in your, in your Torah proper, first five books of Moses. This word, koinos, doesn't show up there. It does show up in the New Testament, but it doesn't show up in the Old Testament. So what's the point I'm trying to make? Follow along with me. Um, the reason it doesn't show up there is because uh, the word koinos is not the normative word that would be designated uh, for clean or unclean animals. It's not the term that would have been chosen in the Greek to represent what in the Hebrew is trying to designate or define as unclean animals. We're still talking about food, all right? Romans 14. And then lastly, there are two more terms that we don't need to focus on too much, but it's the word katharos, where, Paul, where um, God says, what I have cleansed, don't consider unclean. It's a normal word that shows up for clean or cleansed, katharos in the Greek uh, from the Septuagint is the normal word for clean. Uh, this particular tool shows it as um, pure, clean, containing no foreign mixture, morally pure, religiously pure, clean from dirt, etc., etc., or innocent. Um, the word innocent there is important for my study. Uh, this other tool, katharos, Strong's number 2513, again, clean, pure, unsustained, either literally or ceremonially or spiritually guiltless, innocent, upright. So that's another word uh, if it's been clean. So remember, um, going back to what Paul said in Romans 14, he says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, right? And he uses the word koinon, which is the root word koinos, but, if it's, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. And again, it's the word koinos. So let's go back to my commentary in Romans and pick up the study and see how much further we can get with this. Um, I think I'll read this one paragraph, and then uh, we'll probably have to revisit this again, because this is going to get, again, we have to get through the technicalities first, because that's what it takes for us to appreciate what the original readers and authors would have understood by reading Paul's letter, which... Hello, wasn't written in English. Okay, so Paul wasn't Paul wasn't using terms like clean and unclean. He was using um, koinos, akathertos, and things like that. All right. Answer to my question that I asked about why did Peter use two different words? Here's the answer, and this is going to relate to the uh, Pauline study. The word common in the English of verse 14. Um, of not just Acts chapter 10, but also in Romans chapter 14. Isn't that kind of a neat coincidence? The common in the English of verse 14 is the Greek word koinos. And I say in my commentary that it refers to biblically defined and permitted food, which is beef, chicken, lamb, etc., that has been rendered profane 
for instance, by contact with that which the Bible forbids and does not define as food, such as pork, shellfish, shrimp, buzzards, spiders, mouse, etc. So, the very first thing I say right out of the gate is there's a Greek term that's applied to food that God says is it's okay to eat, but it has been defiled from a man's perspective due to its contact or proximity to something that is deemed unclean. Um, so it's not the same word that we would talk about as um, uh, unclean from God's perspective. Really, the easiest way, if I could kind of break some of this down and get less technical for you, as I interact with this passage, one of the one of the details that helps me understand what Paul is writing, what Peter wrote, uh, what Peter said to God, is that these technical terms, koinos, akathertos, clean, unclean, etc., these terms were used in the context of, from their perspective, something that God designated as permissible to eat, that is clean or unclean, uh, you know, you can eat it or you can't eat it, and something that man came along and added as an extra definition of either clean or unclean. And so, God can say something's clean, and man can say it's unclean. God can say it's unclean, and man can say it's clean. Notice the challenge of authority. Whose authority are you going to go with? In the end, I choose to go with God's authority. If God says it's unclean, man says it's clean, I'm going to go with God's authority. God says it's unclean. Conversely, if God says it's clean and man says it's unclean, I'm going to still go with God's authority. But the challenge in Paul's day is that the Jewish religious people, people who were trying to do what God asked them to do, were taking food that God said was clean, was allowable, but they would find that particular animal, that food, that permissible food, being used in religious settings that were pagan or um, settings where too many people had touched that particular food. So you got a, a cut of beef that by God's standards is perfectly admissible, uh, permissible to eat. Um, God says it's allowable, right? It's on the clean list. But as a religious Jew, it's been handled by not only pagan priests, but it's been handled by quite a few other pagans, um, sorry, quite a few other Gentiles as well. And then you encounter this piece of meat. And you have to ask yourself, do I know where this piece of beef has been? God says it's allowable to eat. From a biblical standard, it's clean. It's a clean animal. But it's been handled by a lot of people, and it, it might have been used in a pagan ceremony. Therefore, I'm going to attach an adjective known as common koinos, to this particular beef, and I'm going to avoid it. Therefore, it's common to me. It's unclean. And the confusion for us in English is that the term unclean can be used, is actually used by the translators to designate something that is actually biblically permissible. It's just been rendered common by human perspective. And so this is really why we have to have this discussion. I'm going to close with this tonight. I won't read any further. Uh, we'll, we'll leave off tonight and we'll pick this up next week where we um, start uh, where we're continuing to look through the technical terms. The reason why we even have to have these discussions today is because in English we've got two Greek words that are you that are rendered by the same English word. That's the problem. We've got Greek word A, which is a kathartos, and Greek word B, which is koinos, but we've got one English term, which is unclean. And that's the confusion. The confusion is caused by the translation. It's not really caused by the original autograph, the original language. There's no confusion there. Peter knew what clean and unclean was. Paul knew what clean and unclean was. But today, we don't have any idea because we're removed from the context and we're removed from those original languages. We'll pick this up next week, so I hope that I didn't confuse you too much with some of the technicalities tonight. If you have questions, write in to me or leave comments in the, in the YouTube video, and I'll do my best to explain this a bit more. But that'll do it for now for uh, Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food, Oh My. Let's turn to exploring the Shema, discussions on the issues of Trinity. And we're in this section, Is Yeshua God an Appeal to History? And... Um, we're just going to jump right into it. Last week, we looked at this appeal to mystery and how Dr. Anderson let, um, tells us that, um, mysteriously speaking, God is one, yet God is three. How can he be one and three at the same time? 
mysteriously speaking, God is one being who reveals himself as three persons. And that's the mystery. It's the mystery of the incarnation. How that the, the um, eternal God can become frail human. How was that possible? It's, of course, the mystery that's always going to challenge us as we read our Bibles. There's another way to approach this topic of Trinity, and Dr. Bo Branch is going to, he's also a Trinitarian. Here's the language that he likes to use. Quote, lastly, this is what I have to say. Lastly, before we go on to explore the scriptural basis for drawing Trinitarian theology from the actual pages of the Bible itself, remember, this is a review. We've already gone through this in the past. I'm just reviewing it for us once again. So as we're looking at Trinity in the Bible, let us see how another professionally trained analytic philosopher of Christian theology solves the logical problem of the Trinity using language that appeals to what he labels the historical approach. Why do we care about the, um, the analytic perspective? Because of um, um, Unitarian Christians uh, like, say, Dr. Dale Tuggy, who are so vocal in their perspective that the Bible um, presents weakened versions of Trinitarian theories. He doesn't reject all of the um, all of the Ill- illogicalities of Trini- of all Trinitarian theories. He doesn't lump them all together. What Dr. Tuggy recognizes as a Unitarian Christian is that there are some stronger, word- strongly worded Trinitarian theories and some weaker ones. And uh, in other words, there's some good ones and some bad ones. And um, in the end, most of them, if not all of them, carry um, inconsistencies at the logical level. I can't remember if he really just rejects all of them outright. I think in the end he's open to say that um, some Trinity theories are uh, are so worded in such a way that, hey, if that's the type of Trinitarian theology you want to hold to, I don't have a problem with it as a Unitarian um, because the wording is carefully uh, um, articulated so as to avoid formal inconsistencies. But basically the big problem that he has is the majority of Trinitarian theologies out there, theories, right, we're talking about theorizing it from a Trinitarian perspective, most of the language that we use as Trinitarian Christians is simply me- so uh, it's metaphysical psychobabble, um, wonky metaphysics, we just say things that don't make sense, um, we, we, too, we use too many ambiguities, and thus we're guilty of, of gross amount of equivocation. That's the problem. Dr. Bo Branson is a Trinitarian Christian uh, of the Orthodox uh, persuasion, meaning he's not a Catholic Trinitarian. He's an Orthodox. He's more closely aligned with the Greek Orthodox uh, Christian uh, denominational uh, background. And so he's going to articulate his Trinitarian understanding uh, from that perspective. Let's hear what he has to say. I say in my own commentary, Dr. Bo Branson is assistant professor of philosophy at Brescia University in Kentucky. I think I'm saying that right, Brescia. And his research focuses on the philosophy of the early church fathers, thus uh, what I said, Orthodox Greek. Um, Dr. Branson frequently interacts with Dr. Tuggy's research on social Trinitarianism. Social Trinitarianism, if you recall, is a type of Trinitarianism that um, uh, articulates God's nature in terms of three beings that... um, are differentiated in person, in personhood, but they work together um, to support one another so much so that God's love is expressed across the personhood of the Trinity. God is love, and yet God cannot love uh, in eternity unless there is another person for him to love. So God the Father eternally loves the Son. God the Son ter- eternally loves the Father. And the love, of course, is shared across the personhood with the Holy Spirit. Thus, in the social Trinitarian model, we need three persons, or at least more than one identity, to have this shared social interaction. Um, Dr. Tuggy also talks about relative identity Trinitarianism, or RI. And um, uh, Dr. Branson interacts with relative uh, Trinitarianism as well. Relative identity Trinitarianism um, uh, doesn't focus so much on the persons of God. Rather, it focuses on the identity of the individual, the aspect that God is... um, 
God has this relative identity that when we're focusing on the Father, that identity is God, and the identity is the Father when we're talking about persons as a Trinitarian. But when we're trying to uh, focus on the Son um, and Jesus, we can still bring in the identity of God, but it's relative it's relative, relatively speaking, um, it's different from God the Father, but it doesn't have to focus on God the Father at the, at the moment. So there's just a little bit of confusion uh, on our part between social trinitarianism and relative identity trinitarianism. I don't need you to focus on that right now, and I'm not even I'm probably not even defining those two terms at uh, uh, the best way possible because I'm not really trying to focus on that right now. It's just part of my study. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more as we work our way down uh, through the study. This is just review. This is why I'm going through some of this rather quickly. But Dr. Branson um, favors an approach uh, that I say he himself favors, and it's called monarchical Trinitarianism, or MT. Now, the reason why this is important for us, especially in our review, is in the Greek, there is no Greek word that we would render in the English as monotheism. Instead, it's monarchial, or monarchian. And thus we get the word monarchical. Mono arche is made up of two Greek words. One arche. Um, but in the church fathers, in the early uh, days of the apostles of the apostles, and the first century, and the second century, and the third century, and following, the debates that took place between the Unitarian perspectives and the Trinitarian perspectives, they didn't use the term monotheism like we use it today. Instead, they the terminology that you find, if I'm correct, if I remember, is the term monarchical. And thus, Dr. Bo Branson, who is a Trinitarian, is going to fall back to that terminology as well. Monarchical Trinitarianism is basically monotheistic Trinitarianism. Trinitarianism, he just uses the term that's preferred by the early church fathers. So that fancy term, monarchical, don't get confused. The uh, definitions of these different Trinitarian theories, I say in my commentary, will be summarized alongside each other in the last few bullet points of the final quote from Dr. Branson below. But briefly explaining monarchical Trinitarianism first, here's what he has to say. So let's look at this quote. Um, I'm going to look at just one paragraph, and then we'll um, call the, draw the study to a close. I won't wax too long tonight because I know these technical terms can go over many people's heads. <laughs> Alrighty. But for some, for some of you, this is very necessary and very beneficial. So I'm not trying to, to downplay, I'm not trying to dumb down my commentary and say, well, everybody out there listening to my commentary, you're just, you guys are just too dumb to figure this stuff out. And uh, uh, we, we Bible teachers who know the Hebrew and the Greek, we're the ones who have all the inside knowledge. That's not what I'm trying to convey at all, so please don't even misunderstand. What I'm simply trying to say is in everyday terminology, it's not really even necessary to go through all the technical Hebrew and the Greek and things like that. Um, we, we really have a reliable, trustable source to work from, and that's the Bible itself. Even in the um, interpretations that we carry, the Greek, or the, the, I'm sorry, the English, or whatever language that uh, you choose to carry as a translation. The Bible is reliable, it's trustable, it's not necessary to get ultra-technical when it comes to understanding who God is. In most translations, the truth of who God is and how He reveals Himself in the persons of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is carried along in the translation clearly enough for us to make an informed decision as Bible students today. Omain, Omain. So let's read just this one paragraph, and then we'll um, call this part of my commentary, or part of my, part of my study, quits. And we'll look at the video. Here's what Dr. Bo Branson has to say. He's talking about monarchical Trinitarianism, which again is monotheistic Trinitarianism. So, what's the logic here? This is his terminology. Simply put, it's analytic that a father must have a son. Right away, just using the terminology, he's trying to let us know that if you are designated as a father, then this assumes that you have a son. The terminology itself must mean that you have a son. God is called the father in numerous places of the Bible. Thus, he must have a son. That's what we mean by analytic. He continues, God is a necessary being, 
right? Logically speaking, both from a Unitarian perspective and a Trinitarian perspective, we can't have God not exist. In, in the discussion of whether or not God exists, even the scientists will have to agree that at the end of the day, where did this matter that we refer to as the Big Bang, where did it come from, right? Who banged the bang? If we're going to talk about the Big Bang, uh, philosophically speaking, what is the source of all of the matter? Right? Where? What? Who or what is the arche? What's the beginning? The fountainhead? Where does everything stem from? So God becomes the necessary um, part of the equation that makes sense of everything. Even if our definition of God is just an impersonal force, it still becomes part of a necessary, uh, a necessary part of the equation. So that's what he means by God is a necessary being. And so, because he is a necessary being, he exists at all times in all possible worlds. No matter what discussion we're having, Unitarian, Trinitarian, or secular, humanistic, it doesn't really matter. Um, the being of God is a necessary topic. And his existence must factor into the equation. Dr. Branson continues, So, if the one God is essentially a father, right? God is essential. And, according to the Bible, he is essentially a father. And, if fatherhood is what Gregory of Nyssa would call God's idioma, roughly what we in analytic philosophy would call God's individual essence. So, he's using analytic terminology or philosophic terminology, um, uh, God's um, idioma or idioma, um, God's uh, essence or um, the nature of God's being. Uh, um, what, you know, what, what is it that makes God who he is? Um, and part of what Dr. Branson agrees is that God's fatherhood is essential to his very nature. God is God and God is a father. So fatherhood is an indispensable part of his identity. You can't speak of God without also um, recognizing that God is a father. And thus he continues in his little syllogism here. Then if, it's, if, if God is God, and God is a father, and God is necessary, and fatherhood is part of his identity, then the Son of God exists, and has always existed, indeed necessarily exists. So you have to follow his logic. If God is, and, and, and Father is part of who God is, then the Son must also exist, because sonship is implied from fatherhood. God's title of Father and Yeshua's title as Son are linked together. And if God is eternal as a Father, then the Sonship of Messiah must also be, you ready for it? Eternal. And that's exactly what Dr. Branson says in his final uh, statement of his syllogism. But if the Son of God is himself a necessary being, then he is not a creature. And if the Son of God is not a creature, then the only thing left is that he is divine. So, this is in contradiction to what Dr. Tuggy teaches, that the Son of God is a created being. He's a creature. Dr. Tuggy's version of Unitarianism defines Jesus as the chief of God's creation, the first of God's creation. Chief being the first thing that God created, the first being that God created. And then... Jesus goes on to create everything else. And in case you're not catching it, and I'm closing with this, that version of monotheism that I'm describing that Dr. Tuddy holds to, of Unitarianism, is extremely similar to other forms of monotheistic Unitarianism that we're familiar with today. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is a creature. Mormons also believe that Jesus is a creature. Um, Oneness Pentecostals, I don't know if they say that Jesus is a creature, but they definitely say that there's only one being and his name is Jesus, so that God is Jesus and Jesus is God and Jesus just is God and God just is Jesus. In fact, there's really no true Father or Holy Spirit. Jesus is the name of the Trinity. Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is just that single name, uh, if I'm correctly understanding one is Pentecostalism. But there are other quasi-Christian groups out there of the Unitarian monotheistic persuasion that 
form views of who Jesus is, and they basically all fall into some category similar to Arianism, uh, that Jesus is not eternal in his deity, that he is a lesser God. He is a creature that God created and formed and then glorified or deified or or turned into a God. Uh, Christadelphians, um, Iglesia ni Cristo, um, uh, we could we could jump out of Christianity and just go straight into Islam or rabbinic Judaism, um, where we're talking about a Messiah who's fully human, or or uh, something like that. So in the end, in closing, as biblical Trinitarians, it would do us well to pay attention, like we're going to learn next week, that historically speaking, as Dr. Branson is going to bring up. Historically speaking, the early church fathers reading through the scriptures recognized that God is the eternal God and that he is the eternal Father. And as the eternal Father, the Son must also be eternal or else God is not an eternal Father. That's how the logic fits together. If God's fatherhood is not eternal, then the sonship is of Messiah is also likewise not eternal. In other words, um, if God only became a father when he created Jesus, then fatherhood is not eternal. Of course, the early church fathers didn't hold to that position. They believed that God's um, fatherhood was eternal. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at next week. But that'll do it for exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. Let's turn to the video, watch the video for tonight, and then after the video's over, um, oops, you know what? I skipped the liturgy. Well, we read some Greek liturgy earlier um, when we read through our Roman study. Let me just uh, remind us once again of some of the um, Hebrew liturgy. Uh, let's see, where did I have it? There we go. We were looking at Exodus. We looked at this uh, last week, two weeks and three weeks ago. And I wanted to read these one more time just in their entirety. Three verses in the liturgy, just verse 13, 14, and 15 of Exodus chapter 3. I'm not going to read any Greek tonight because we read through some Greek um, uh, earlier in the Roman study. So let's just look at this. Exodus 3, I'll read the English and then the Hebrew over on the uh, right side of the page. That'll be the liturgy for tonight. And I won't wax long on this. It was a kind of a mini study on on the name of God, uh, I am who I am, and things like that. If you missed all that, go back and listen to last week's study, episode number 148, and just listen to the liturgy part. Um, Exodus 3, verse 13, Then God said to Moses, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let's go back and re up and read the uh, Hebrew real quick, starting on the right side of the page right there. Verse 13 says, Vayomer Moshe el ha'elohim, hine anochi el b'nei Yisrael, va'amarti lachem, elohe avotechem, shlachni alechem, va'amru li ma shmo ma omar alechem. Verse 14 says, Vayomer Elohim el Moshe, Eche Asher Eche. We looked at how last week that this term Eche is actually God's personal way in first person pronoun saying that I am. But when Moses relays God's name back to the people, he drops down into third person, just like we would do in English, saying he is. Thus, Eche is the way God would say his name, but Yahweh is the way we would say his name. And that's the careful distinction. And that's why throughout the Bible, Eche shows up very, very uh, briefly, doesn't show up in very many places, primarily right here in Exodus 3 and a few, a few other places, but primarily Eche is only comes out of God's mouth directly. But 6,000 plus times throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we find the writer saying, He is, He is. That's Yahweh, Yahweh. Okay? Um, so, um, and then verse uh, 15 says, uh, Od Elohim El Moshe Ko Tomar El Bnei Yisrael Yahweh Elohei Avotechem 
Elohe Avotechem, I'm sorry, Elohe Abraham, Elohe Yitzchak, the Elohe Yaakov, Shlachni Alechem, Ze Shmil Olam, Ze Zikri Lador Dor. And that'll do it for the liturgy for tonight. Let's turn to the, uh, the, the short little video. Uh, those of you with me in live study, um, we'll watch the video, and then after the video is over, we'll just simply dismiss in prayer. You guys ready? Here we go. This video functions as a continuation of my earlier video, Did the Apostle Paul Preach the End of the Law? You can click here to watch the previous video. Short questions, short answers by Torah teacher Ariel. That's me. All right, here's our question. Question, what does it mean that Jesus fulfilled the law but did not abolish it? Now we have a reading from Matthew uh, 5, 17, and 18 again. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to, to destroy but to fulfill. And heaven and earth will pass away till one jot or tittle pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's We read that in our liturgy. So I'm just kind of emphasizing that's what we're seeing on the slides. Jesus did indeed bring the law to its fullest intended meaning and expression. The Greek word pleiro, which is fulfill in Matthew 5, 17, simply means to fill to the top to make full, to bring to realization. Contrary to popular Christian teaching, God's Torah never commanded or expected sinless perfection, else the sacrifices for sin would be meaningless. However, in Messiah, we are in fact supposed to strive towards perfection in his life until we one day finally put it on for eternity. Therefore, in this life, and while the temple stood in Jerusalem, true obedience to Torah included bringing sacrifices when a person sinned. Thus, the Torah actually anticipates our failure to keep it from time to time by making provision for our shortcomings. You can read Galatians 3.19 to catch the theology that I'm explaining there. Without expecting sinless perfection, the Torah nevertheless does consider even a single breach to be guilty of violating the whole. Thus, to break one commandment was to be guilty of breaking them all. Recall Jacob, James 2, verse 10. And since the final payment for sin would have demanded the final death of the sinner, per Ezekiel 18.20, Yeshua actually paid this price by dying in our place, thus fulfilling the payment required by the Torah. Of course, we're talking about substitutionary atonement. What does that look like? We've got this sin debt on our back. It's quite heavy. But then Yeshua comes along and stamps it paid in full, right? That sin debt has been paid. Amen? Amen. But Yeshua's words here in Matthew carry an additional meaning as evidenced by his own explanation of verses 18 to 20, and indeed the rest of the Sermon on the Mount carries this extended meaning as well. So let's, let's kind of go through that. That's what we're going to do a little later. In the following verses, the Master plainly reveals that all of the Torah must eventually be fulfilled and even implies that true followers of God will carry out this fulfillment by doing and teaching others to do even the least of the commandments. We'll read that a little bit later on. After all, just because Yeshua obeyed the Torah perfectly, this doesn't excuse believers from remaining obedient to his commandments. Make sense? On the contrary, now that we have a perfect example of Torah obedience to emulate, we too, by the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, can and should pursue Torah obedience and teach others to do so if we wish to be obedient to the Master's words here in Matthew. That's, of course, what Paul had in mind, right? So what exactly got nailed to the cross if it was not the Torah? Paul explains in Colossians 2.14 that it was the certificate of our debt, our ultimate failure to pay for our sins, that was nailed to the cross. It was not the Torah that was nailed to the cross. As we follow this, this what we're talking about tonight. We owed God a debt that we could not pay because the payment demanded a sinless sacrifice, a payment we could never make on our own. This accords with the Torah, which actually adjudicates penalties for unrepentant sinners. By Yeshua's blood, those penalties, those debts, they've been paid in full and have satisfied God's courtroom ledger. 
those are the things that have been nailed to the cross. There's that, that bill with the, you know, that we owed. Elsewhere in Romans, Paul teaches that because believers had died to sin in Yeshua, the ultimate penalty for sin, death, no longer applies to us. Jesus nailed those penalties of the Torah that were reserved for unrepentant sinners to his cross. Amen. I'm glad he did. So, to walk in disobedience and lack of trust is to invite God's punishment and withholding of blessing. To belong to the family is to mentally, spiritually, and physically accept the family rules. To this end, both Jews and Gentiles are expected to practice Torah submissiveness within their hearts and within their communities. The Torah is a community document. To submit to God is to desire and allow His Holy Spirit to continually mold a person's life into the example of the Son of God who vividly displayed a Torah obedient and submissive life. This is the responsibility of a believer. To suppose that faith outside of resulting action alone is pleasing to God is to misunderstand the valuable lesson explained by Yaakov by James. Such faith is barren and of no value to God. Make sense? Conversely, to mistakenly replace the genuine faith that the Torah teaches with halakhic rules, group policies designed to regulate one's identity with God, is to misunderstand Paul's valuable lesson. You've got to have a balance between James and Paul there. Such actions also prove to be displeasing to God and unacceptable as righteous. Well, that'll be it for the uh, short version. Catch my podcast on iTunes, search term Ariel Hanavi. And uh, if you are a YouTuber, well, then I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, right? Uh, new content is added weekly. So um, I do my best to try and put something up there for all of you to uh, catch week after week. Okay. And that'll do it for the video for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name, and I thank you for the study. I thank you for the opportunity to um, to share with people from around the world thoughts that are uh, on my heart, uh, the scriptures that I've studied this week. I know some of this can be confusing. Uh, the topics are challenging. Um, Romans 14 and Trinity studies and the topics that I focus on uh, for the moment. Um, Lord, I don't have all the answers. I'm not even pretending that I have all the answers, um, which is why I go to you and why I also rely on the um, valuable research of other people. I'm blessed to be able to um, study along with the other students um, week after week so that we can grow together and strengthen one another. Lord, forgive us where we fail one another and where we fail you. Help us to continue to lift one another up in prayer and support to um, uh, continue to um, befriend one another uh, and just uh, be supportive of each other's difficulties trying to uh, uh, sympathize and empathize and um, just you know have, have a shoulder to cry on when that's needed as well um, we need to continue to uh, strengthen ourselves not just in Messiah but uh, to the ability that we can Lord as, as things are just getting confusing in the world in the United States and in other places uh, we've got to continue to keep our eyes focused on God but also to help one another so it's not all about looking at looking towards the sky and looking towards heaven and just realizing well you know God's gonna sort everything out but you know we have to have a practical mind as well but at the same time our feet are here on planet Earth and um, we, we haven't gone, been taken home yet, so help us to make sense of what's going on around us uh, and just to continue to trust in you. Strengthen us and go with us this week. Uh, bring us back together next week, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory of Hashem Yeshua. Amen. That concludes our show for today. It is my desire that this continuing series of teachings will assist the average non-Jewish believer or new Messianic Jewish believer in his desire to become a more mature child of God. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. 
to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, it is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song were written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For more information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com. 